Thanks so much uh, for that, uh, Meghna. We all know, in fact, uh, Mr. Sanyal as a member of the Prime Minister's uh, Economic Advisory Council, but he wears very many hats. Not just an economist, he's also written a lot of books on history, more recently on, recently on our uh, entire freedom movement, about the entire history of a thousand years before that. And very, very interestingly, I'm going to talk to him about a project that he has, related to history, of course, that he just told me 15 minutes ago and surprised me very pleasantly about. Uh, Mr. Sanyal, you are also working beyond your historical and academic projects on something related to a ship. Can you tell us about this? So, uh, you know, I, as you just mentioned, I've written many books. One of the books I wrote was called The Ocean of Churn, which is a history of the Indian Ocean. And uh, the reason I wrote that book is that for uh, reasons that are, we can debate, uh, our history is very often told to us as a terrestrial landlocked history. Whereas in fact, if we just look at a map, look, we are the only country in the world which has a ocean named after it. And not surprisingly, a very large part of our history is actually maritime. And yet the only thing we hear about it, huh, the Cholas did some raid on the, the Indonesia a thousand years ago. That's pretty much the sum total of what you will hear. Whereas, in fact, we have probably the most colorful maritime history of any country in the world, going back to the Bronze Age. I mean, there were Indians sailing to Mesopotamia 5,000 years ago. So I thought that one way of rediscovering it is to actually build a ship from, you know, thousands of years ago. So I did some research as a part of writing that book, but then later on built on it and then discovered that there are still a very small number of people who have retained the technique of building ships by stitching them together. Now, they haven't built for many generations a large ship. They built coastal, small boats, etc. So when you say stitching them together, this is without nails, without, without nails. modern carpentry. Yeah, they it interlocked is, and then, they interlocked and then and stitched together with using coir ropes. So it's a completely unique technique. The technique was used for thousands of years for Indians to build ocean-going ships. It's now rapidly dying out, but I thought that before it dies out, let me get hold of these guys. And then, based on a painting in Ajanta, and a book called the Yukti Kalpataru, which is an ancient book written by Raja Bhoj in the 9th century, and then other evidence that I also gathered. So, putting it all together, we are now building this uh, ancient ship, built pretty much with every... It's, got pretty much nothing modern in it, except the toilets. <laughs> and, uh, and we are, uh, it has no nails in it, and it, so we are building this ship, and as we speak, it's being put together by this last group of uh, uh, you know, people who remember this technique uh, in uh, Goa, in right. Divar and, Island. And what's very interesting, ladies and gentlemen, is that it's not just a showpiece. You're actually going to sail this down all the way across various Asian countries. And that's going to be quite a task. You're going to be sailing with it. Yes, uh, I intend to sail with it. Why would I take all the trouble and uh, not ha let somebody else have the fun? <laughs> so, uh, yes, so uh, the ship is being put together. And about a year from now, it will, we will have it in a position to put it in the water. Then it'll take some time to test it and kit it out. Uh, but in December, uh, the um, Honorable Prime Minister and the, His uh, Highness, the Sultan of uh, Oman, made a joint declaration that the very first voyage of the ship will be from India to Muscat, from Mandvi to Muscat, to be precise. Uh, it's a three-week three voyage. And if that succeeds, we will then take it to the other coast <coughs> uh, uh, and try and sail from uh, Kalinga, or Odisha, all the way to Bali to recreate this, the Bali Jatra. That's probably a two, three-month voyage. So that's some distance away, but... And two, three months. Round of applause. Because it's not going to be easy. There are no modern amenities on this ship. You won't have any electricity. You won't have uh, any kind of navigation. No possible. air conditioning, blazing hot. And, you know, you'll, there'll be storms and other nasty things that will happen. And remember, that we also don't know exactly how the ship will behave in water. Because, as I said, the hull is flexible since it's stitched together. It's not nailed together. Uh, it doesn't have a proper rudder. It has a trailing oar, which is what ancient ships used to use. Uh, we don't have a lanteen sail. We are using square sails, which is a type of sail that was used in ancient times. 
but remember modern uh, sailors don't use this so my crew which the um, indian navy is uh, very uh, kindly providing which will be about 12 uh, people from the indian navy these sailors have are expert sailors in modern ships but when sailing a new ship like this they will have to relearn the whole thing so wow. i am very grateful to the ministry of culture and to the indian navy for supporting this uh, somewhat mad cap project of mine well that's my next question why would someone like you who could very easily have an air conditioned office in north or south block or some other corner of uh, delhi someone who's known for writing books and perhaps more recently a netflix series why would you take on a project like this so i think this is important that you understand what we what is the the aim here and why i am doing this despite having you know another whole uh, area of work in e- e- you know building the economy uh, which is you know running the world's fastest growing economy is also a full time job the reason is that you need to understand we that we are not just building an economy we are rebuilding a civilization and because we are rebuilding a civilization it requires a much wider ambit of things that you need to build you need to build the ship you also need to build the highways the airports you need to have the startups and this requires us to have a certain self of a sense of ourselves a certain aspiration so this requires we need to break out out this hum gareeb the gareeb hain har kisi tarah se gareeb rahenge mindset and begin to aspire so when that requires a certain culture of risk taking adventure and so on which is inherent in also sending spaceship to the moon uh let's build our own parliament uh and let's build this ancient ship because it's part of getting ourselves out of this mindset which has been by the way to some not not something we sell to ourselves but in fact been sold to ourselves us during the colonial period in particular that somehow we were a peaceful passive people other people came and always colonized us we never did anything actively so i we need to break out of that mindset all right so this is also what you refer to you in your in your book uh, the indian renaissance when you talk about the thousand years of decline so in a sense you're trying to sort of arrest that decline or reverse that process and uh, uh, you've also uh, talked about how it was something that is not just about 250 years of british colonialism but also about 700 odd years before that that this process began take us through that so this is the point i make is that look when does a country go through a renaissance so it's very often very difficult to tell it from your own times So let's take another part of the world where everybody agrees there was a renaissance which is the european renaissance now between the decline of the roman empire and the european renaissance there is also another about 1000 years of decline that europe went through now what happens is that suddenly around about the year 1400 to 1500 and around about 1400 you begin to see suddenly in small towns in northern italy something happens florence venice etc now you think of the renaissance just as some sort of an artistic movement it's not it is actually an opening of mind it's a rebirth and it happens in every field simultaneously so what is the great contribution of florence to the world it's actually double entry bookkeeping it was a banking hub venice was the stock market it was a commercial hub the art that you see is actually something that they did on the side it's also about at the same time that galileo is breaking out of uh, 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 of uh, and creating new forms of science uh, it's leonardo da vinci he is not just doing art he's also doing these engineering pro- uh, these engineering projects so this breaking out is actually a, is a mindset and the what i am attempting to do is to break out and create this mindset we need to have this mindset so this also fits in with the overall theme of atmanirbharta the prime minister this government often talk about but uh, there are many who would raise a question as to how is this atmanirbharta any different from self reliance for instance that previous prime ministers and governments spoke about here in india fundamentally different so the 1950s atmanirbharta is born out of fear that we can't compete we need import substitution here that is not the case we want to create capabilities here we don't mind foreign in fact we encourage foreign companies to come here this is not about protecting the ambassador car right 
we want to compete in the rest of the world and uh, and capture markets we just want these capacities to come up here also we don't uh, when we say atmanirbharta what do we mean let i'll give you an example we have a pharmaceuticals industry globally competitive now during covid we discovered that this great pharmaceuticals industry is totally dependent on single foreign sources for its inputs now that is a serious threat to our resilience so if we want to be resilient to these supply chain risks and happened with chips as well then we need to have certain amount of capacity that is here now if we were singapore and we couldn't we were, you know we couldn't create capacity in every sector then i understand we are india we can create large capacities in all kinds of sectors including manufacturing so this is the reason we are thinking about it in this way but it is a it is a thinking which is based not on defense but on offense right right also uh, you know if i can take a contrarian view on uh, on on this issue of uh, culture uh, uh, you know there are those who say that of course it's very important that we are confident about our culture about our civilization roots and we've seen a lot of emphasis on that but there are also who say, those who say that if we emphasize too much on that for instance there are violent events that we all know that took place after 1992 uh, if these sort of uh, thoughts are taken to an extreme do you think that is a valid concern see everybody is concerned on uh nationalism will go back and say oh look what happened with the nazis or something like that right now look the europeans have much to answer for their nationalism they should answer for it our nationalism is based on rebuilding our country and our civilization in fact much of our nationalism grew uh, out of resistance to their uh, colonization why do we have to be apologetic for their uh, crimes let them be apologetic right right also uh, recently there's been uh, you know some you must have seen some of these articles about billionaire raj which i today saw even mr yachuri tweeting about uh, the allegation or the presumption at that point of time is that uh, uh, you know all of this uh, with all that we've seen over the last few years have created a sort of situation where income inequalities are at an all time high this is the argument and they are comparing this to the colonial times how would you as an economist uh, look at this particular claim that has been made is this even factually borne out in your view first of all that study which piketty and company have done is actually utter garbage and you know that because in their own report if you just read the the small print at the bottom all the which by the way uh, surjit bhalla and karan basin have art, published an article about just read their own uh, sort of footnotes you will know that you know the data they have used to compare different periods are not comparable so first of all the, the this is based on utter garbage but let me take the th not the study but the thought into account so everywhere there is this thing oh my god there is billionaire raj okay adani ambani look i grew up in kolkata of the 1980s i grew up listening to tata birla tata birla ha huh. so the problem is really with having these billionaires now notice that all of these people all the people who make all this allegations all the studies that give all of this are funded by the following people ford foundation rockefeller foundation soros is open open society omidyar bill gates foundation ye log kon hain ye bhi to billionaire hi hain now all these think tanks ngos etc don't have problem with gora billionaires as long as the billionaire is white it's perfectly fine it's a problem with brown billionaires right <laughs> thomas piketty aake kya yahan naukri dega <laughs> thomas piketty has not generated any jobs at the best of my knowledge we need to generate jobs we are one third of the world's population one third of the world's billionaires should live in india that's our fair share all of these people are very proud about celebrating their billionaires aap america jaiye ha they celebrate bill gates elon musk and so on they have a problem with us celebrating our billionaires i think we need more billionaires and first generation billionaires so that is what we should aim for not fewer billionaires more billionaires right 
Very interesting point of view over there, uh, indeed. And in fact, I'm told that we have some images ready of uh, your uh, 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 ship that we were discussing a short while ago. Let's quickly get that on the screen so that we can show what, in fact, Mr. Sanya is talking about and the kind of difficult circumstances. If we can quickly get those images on the screen and you can describe them to us. Uh, I believe we have it uh, on the screen here. Are we going to get it on the screen? Or I don't think they're up. Okay, whenever yet. it comes up. <laughs> whenever it comes up yet. But let me ask you a couple of other questions. Uh, you've also spoken uh, very interestingly in your Netflix series that has come about. Uh, it's going to be talking a lot about the revolutionaries and several of the lesser known freedom fighters. What inspired you to do that? Was there some particular thought process, perhaps your own personal experiences that drove you to that? See, the book that I've written, Revolutionaries, which came out last year, <clears throat> is about the armed resistance to British colonial rule. Now, the way the official story of our freedom struggle is, is that it was somehow uniquely non-violent that we politely asked the British to leave and they left. Um, you know, bina khadak, bina dhal. But the fact of the matter is, the resistance to British rule has a very long history and much longer history of armed resistance, going back to the Marathas, Sikhs, Polygars and so on. So on but into the 20th century of a very well-organized revolutionary movement. As it happens to be, both my mother's and father's family were involved in it. And this story is somehow never told. You have these occasional sort of stories about individual greats, you know, Chandrasekhar Azad did something, Bhagat Singh did something. But you're left with the impression that these were random acts of resistance. Brave maybe, but didn't add up to anything. But in fact, it was an organized movement with clear objectives, which were sustained by the same people over and over again. So, Raj Bihari Bose, not Netaji, it was Raj Bihari Bose who set up the INA in Singapore in 1943. Now, Raj Bihari Bose has actually, actually almost succeeded in doing the same thing in the First World War also. He had escaped to Japan because it fell apart, the Gadar Rebellion. But what I'm, why I'm telling you this is that this was an organized movement over a half a century and this was only the last part of the armed resistance so this story is unfortunately not systematically told and all I've done in the book revolutionaries is to put it together show that these are the same characters repeating themselves with a clear mandate of whatever objectives in fact it is the revolutionaries who first came up with the idea that India should be totally free not a dominion that India should be a democratic republic with full uh, 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 universal franchise. This was at a time when the Congress was still demanding dominion status and even Britain did not give vote to women. So it was the, the, the Indian Republic of today, the Democratic Republic of today is the brainchild of the revolutionary movement. Right. What are we looking at happening over here? Because there are those who say that we are looking at a rewriting of history. There are those uh, who would say that this is a distortion of history. And there are those who would say that this is just a correction or setting the record straight of what didn't happen for so many years. How do you look at it? Read the uh, stories I'm putting together and telling. For example, just take the revolutionary piece. Just this story, and I, my book is fully referenced. And these histories are not long ago. They have happened almost within living memory. Uh, I, in fact, personally knew many of these people in the 80s because some of them survived into the 80s. And so there are lots of records, their personal uh, testimonies, uh, police records, newspaper articles, all kinds of evidence for how um, uh, our freedom struggle was um, uh, fought. Uh, from the armed resistance perspective and they have a completely different uh, and entirely intellectually coherent explanation for how India became free. Now, it is possible that there are other views of the world, but look, that's fine. This story too needs to be told. 
Right. Uh, let me bring you on to the economy aspect as well. While we've grown at 8.5%, 8.4%, I, I beg your pardon, in the previous quarter, these numbers, of course, are impressive. There are some doubts being raised about the authenticity of the GDP numbers. Mr. Arvind Subramaniam, the former chief economic advisor, said that the latest GDP numbers are mystifying, and he believes that they do not add up. He's spoken about FDI coming down as well as corporate investment below 2016 levels. How do you respond to this? It may be mystifying to him. There is nothing very deeply mystifying. You can look at the data, it's publicly available. You're all from many of these people here work in companies or run companies, look at your own balance sheets. Can you not see the uh, growth in top line and bottom line? Just drive around any major part of India, any major city, can you not see the construction of infrastructure, the construction of housing, of offices? Can you not see it? You can feel this. This is not a theoretical thing. In fact, some of the negative aspects of this rapid growth are also visible. The wonderful air that we have to breathe. Right? The pollution is also a part of this. So, point of the matter is, it's visible. Now, you can, you know, debate about double deflation. Maybe the deflator should have been a little bit up and down. Okay. I mean, I can willing to debate it and there are different stories on that. The fact of the matter is the India's econ that India's economy is now growing at a very rapid pace should be visible. If it didn't concord with what we can visibly see, then we can have a debate. Yeah. Sometime back, few months back, we saw Raghuram Rajan tell Rahul Gandhi that the rate of growth uh, would be best at around 5%. Now, at 8.5%, it's of course quite far off that mark. But the question that many would have in their minds is that is this 84 sustainable? First of all, uh, I can't explain what Raghu had in mind, that you should ask him. But uh, as far as 8.4 is concerned, let me tell you that a lot of this is being driven entirely by internal generation of growth. We are getting no help from the rest of the world because the rest of the world, most of our markets are not uh, growing. I mean, Japan is in recession, Germany is recession. UK is in recession, the US is growing, but there are all kinds of issues with it. So, this is internally generated growth. Now, just before me, Professor Panagaria was here, and he was saying double-digit growth. Now look, it's possible for us to hit double-digit growth, but I would actually be rather careful about it. This whole game is about compounding growth. So, well, this, is this machine that we have reform, brought here capable of generating double-digit growth? Yes, it is, but under very favorable external conditions only. We should not attempt to grow this economy by anything more than what it is growing now if the external environment does not dramatically improve. Because what will happen then is that our external accounts uh, will begin to overheat our inflation will begin to overheat and so on. You can only generate very high rates of growth past what we are growing right now um, if external environment is conducive. Otherwise, we should be satisfied with what we are doing or even something in the range of 7% is perfectly good. Key is do not lose control of macroeconomic stability. It was a very hard-earned uh, thing that we had to do. I mean... As somebody who was involved in cleaning up of the banks, let me tell you, it's like extracting teeth. It's not a fun thing to do. Again, I was a member of the team that managed the economy through the COVID period. Very, very difficult. And at every stage, you will have noticed the thing we emphasized was stability. We were restrained on the fiscal side. We were restrained on the monetary side throughout this whole cycle. Why? Because we are trying to ensure that the macroeconomic stability side is well anchored. So if push comes to shove, if we have to choose, be very clear, we will choose stability over growth. Because this game is about compounding this over 25 years. That's the Amrit Kal cycle. Any one year I don't get emotional about whether we hit 8 or 7 or whatever. In fact, this 8.4 is a wonderful surprise. Our own forecasts, if we will remember, for the government were 65 to 7%. And if it grows at 7%, we would have been perfectly happy.
Right. Uh, in fact, if we can now at least uh, bring up on the side screens, I believe we can bring up those images, I'm told, by our production team. And uh, if we can quickly just go through those images uh, 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 very quickly. Yeah, okay, take us through these images. What are we seeing? Uh, so this is the Im Oops. Uh, you'll have to hold it there okay, at one of the images, and I'll explain each one of them one yeah. by one. So this image, the very first one, is the image of Nao Devi. You see, since we had this maritime culture of crossing the oceans, every m maritime community in ancient times used to worship a local deity, usually a female deity. So in Goa, they used to worship Nao Devi. Now, Nao Devi, there were many shrines to Nao Devi. Most of them were destroyed during the Portuguese period. But I did manage to find one in the forests of Goa. And so this is what a Nao Devi looks like. And this is the goddess to which the ancient mariners used to worship before they set out on these voyages. So before building the ship, I went and actually prayed to Nao Devi. And so this is the shrine of Nao Devi. So next image. Next image, please. Yeah, it's playing. Okay. So as I told you, this shipbuilding that is happening is not happening with n any nails. This is being actually stitched together. So this is the image of how this stitching is done. You can see a specially prepared coir rope. This is not any old coir rope. A specially prepared coir rope is used and the holes are made in the planks. And then the coir rope is taken through them. And then the holes are fixed with a gum called kudrus. Uh, <clears throat> so this is how it is done. So this is one image. If you move to the next slide. So this is what the ship will look like. It's, it's going to be 21 meters long. So I prefer it's about 65 feet long. So it's not a small ship. It will be about the length of this uh, stage perhaps. Um, from the fourth century, you said. Yeah, so it's century. yeah, it's from the fourth century, because it's based on a painting in Ajanta, and you can see the square rigged sails, which I told you are a particular kind of sail, uh, which means that you cannot sail too much of an angle to the wind. You have to sail basically with the wind, uh, which puts all kinds of restrictions on how you sail it. There is no rudder. You can see there's a trailing oar. Um, and uh, there are many other features which are completely uh, pre-modern. So modern sailors actually have to relearn sailing for sailing these ships because its characteristics in a storm, for example, is unknown. Because remember, for example, the hull is going to f flex. You know, big wave comes, the hull actually flexes inward and outward. Now, what happens to the sailing characteristics in a storm, we don't know. So all of this will have to be tested out so that we understand how it works. Similarly, modern sailors know what to do with a lanteen sails and at what angle to sail to the wind. Uh, you know, we will have to figure out what happens with a square sail and so on and so forth. Well, safe travels from all of us here at the Times Network. Sanjeev Sanyal, a round of applause for Mr. Sanyal for, uh, you know, that Thank you. brave, uh, uh, adventurous uh, sort of task that he has embarked upon. And apart from educating us on the economy and our history, now also, uh, you know, proving with this particular voyage some source of inspiration for all of us to look at in terms of uh, these particular voyages. Thanks so much for sharing. Thank you. It's a pleasure.